Ken's right. iPad is. Me too. Um, but that's okay. We're going to start. And uh, as, as I was just saying, we want to welcome those who uh, who aren't able to be with us, who but who are likely to join us um, by seeing the video afterwards. So we're going to say hello to Kim and hello to Sandra and hello to the others who are uh, probably going to join us. And we, we welcome you and we thank you for uh, taking advantage of the fact that it's on the website. It is uh, the second last session. We're going to say this three times because, you know, it's the Trinity and it helps uh, uh, people remember. Next week will be our last uh, session. Oh, Grace, hello. Hi, good morning. <laughs> good morning. Uh, you're radiant. You, you're looking, you're all aglow there, Grace, which is wonderful. Me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. I don't know that. I don't know if I feel radiant. <laughs> well, looks, looks are more than half the battle. So there you go. Um, anyway, next week is our last uh, session. And I was talking with Jean just before uh, we started this morning. And we would like to invite you to have communion so that we can have communion together. Now, well, T.S. Eliot talks about the taking of toast and tea. So uh, you can have whatever libation you want uh, and whatever... Uh, I've got a box of chocolate chip cookies. Bring something to the to the party, so that at the end of the service or ser of the session, we will have a quick little uh, liturgy, and uh, we can have communion together. So that's that's uh, giving you notice for the first time. Gene's going to do it the second time, and then we'll give you a final notice at the end. So hopefully, you'll remember. Uh, but let's begin with prayer as we uh, start this uh, session. Let's pray. Gracious God, as we gathered on this uh, gray Tuesday morning, we give thanks that you not only created all days, but that you created the day and that all of your blessings are new each and every morning. We give thanks that we are able to count those blessings. And among those blessings is the opportunity to gather together through, uh, the, through this medium to study your word and that in studying your word we wrestle with the issues that come before us the issues that the word raises in our minds and in our lives but also wrestle with how we can best serve you and we pray be with us through your spirit as we gather this morning may all that we say and do and wrestle with be to your glory and according to your purpose and we pray all this through jesus christ our lord Oh, man. Oh, man. I'm just going to have to shut the kitchen door here. We've got Regan is entertaining Cedar. <laughs> there we go. Um, Regan is doing her classes at, at home. Uh, so she has her studio upstairs and I have it down here. Down your room. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, as uh, we indicated, this is session number uh, 10 of of the um of 11 and we are literally moving to the end of the gospel the gospel of of mark is 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 short uh and we've discussed this before it is every it, there is not a lot of superfluous verbiage uh there's not a lot of extra stuff or padding this is not uh, the essay of someone in high school who was told they had to have 1,500 words but only had 700 words of ideas. So they filled it out. This is, this is short and sweet, to the point. We talked at the beginning about how, in a way, if you were doing it as a, as a film, each little paragraph would be a storyboard. That would be one scene. Everything you need to know about what happened in that moment is in that paragraph, in that scene, that picture card. And then you go to the next. There's not a lot of connection. It's just boom, boom, boom. And we've talked about how the word immediately keeps coming up. And the way it's written is just as, just as uh, immediate. Everything is quick. The edits, the punctuation, the sentences. So it's no surprise that uh, we are where we are now in uh, 14 or 13 short chapters we are here and uh, other gospels still have a long way to go 
um, one of the things we noted last week was Jesus, who up to this point, or certainly up until last week, had been very equally as reticent, um, a man of few words, very sharp, very laser focused words, but a man of few words, certainly a man of more action, uh, as described by the author of Mark. Uh, and, and, and so we have this just this dynamic personality. Again, everything is moving quickly. Last week, all of a sudden, we ended up with almost a chapter and a half of dialogue, which is, uh, that's the most Jesus says in, uh, in the Gospel of Mark. It, it, he says more at this point, or a bit more here, but not as much. And so we are now at that point where Jesus has been, um, uh, the plot to kill him has reached fever pitch. In the Gospel of Mark, we've had Palm Sunday, the cleansing of the temple, the challenge, and the, uh, and the fact that he's been uh, challenged by the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the, the priests. And we are now moving towards what would be Monday, Thursday. And so our reading starts very quickly with a little two sentence paragraph about the plot to kill Jesus. And, uh, and then the next thing we have is, um, well, we have the anointing at Bethany. We then move forward. Jesus then starts to have the, um, the Passover. The anointing at Bethany is, is uh, I have to say, one of the things that I have been uh, working on and thinking about uh, in my in the trips to Israel is, is I would really love to get to Bethany. Uh, last week in the video, we saw Francis up on a hill, which was a pasture a field with olive trees. That hill is on the is further up the, the Mount of Olives. And Bethany is literally on the uh, eastern side of that hill. The, from a tourist perspective, the Bethany is, uh, there are a number of things there. Um, Lazarus was raised from the dead in Bethany, so there's a large church to that. There's, uh, and also Simon the leper, Martha and Mary. Uh, uh, many biblical scholars believe that this is actually one family or extended family, uh, and that Jesus became very good friends with, the, with this family, and that the reason why he's at this house for this meal is because this was a safe place for him to be. It was walking distance from the temple. It was literally just over the hill and down the valley into the Temple Mount. Uh, and, and so, uh, back in those days, they didn't need Fitbits or iWatches to tell them how to uh, make their, their step counts. They walked everywhere. And so in the midst of all of what was going on, Jesus retreats after his uh, encounter with the uh, Sanhedrin, or Sanhedrin, as we talked about, the, the group of authorities. He went, left the city because things were just getting too uh, hot and tense, goes to a safe place. That's Bethany, that's this house, that's with these people. And it's there that we have uh, one of the most um, uh, spectacular and uh, powerful uh, moments, which is the anointing of, uh, of Jesus. I'm gonna put the readings up on the screen just so that we can sort of follow along on it. Um, but if you have your own uh, copies at home or your, your text at home, uh, you can read along. But anyway, so we're here in the middle with the anointing in Bethany. And the anointing, is, the reason why the anointing is so interesting is it, uh, it has a couple of things that go along with it. There, the background information here talks, uh, breaks down a number of things. Uh, it is believed that the amount of oil that would have been in this alabaster uh, jar uh, would have been literally the inheritance, the life, the life's worth of probably the woman's mother, um, and that this was, this was the dowry. This was the, this was the pot of gold. This was the rainy day fund. This was the everything that they 
uh, this is what they had socked away for when things got bad. And I, I, I don't want to tell you what it's worth today, but it, it is the equivalent of the inheritance. And, and we're not just talking a few hundred dollars. This, this was a large sum of money. Nard uh, was a, a substance that people would make perfume out of. This was, uh, this was something that was used for uh, religious festivals. This was uh, something that only kings or um, wealthy people had. So the fact that these people in Bethany, which was really a freckle <laughs> on the backside of the Mount of Olives, uh, the fact that they would have this. And if you then add in Lazarus, who was a leper, uh, and then um, not, uh, not Lazarus, Simon, uh, the leper, and then Lazarus, who we, you start to think, okay, who are these people? Um, but the point being is, is she brings out this alabaster jar, which in and of itself is uh, expensive, and she breaks it open. And once it's broken open, there's no going back. Uh, and, the, and so she then pours this ointment onto Jesus and uh, starts on his head and it drips down and uh, ends up, you know, down at his feet. And then she starts to wipe her uh, in, um, in another uh, version of this. He, she's wiping his feet with her hair. This is a full on uh, offering to Jesus of of all that she was, what was special to her is now for him. And of course, uh, we're told here, uh, you know, all of a sudden there was one, uh, uh, there were um, some who were there said to one another in anger, why was this ointment wasted in this way? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and the money given to the poor. And, uh, what's interesting is, is this is usually attributed to, to uh, Judas, uh, these lines, and it, they're attributed to Judas because apparently Judas is uh, interested in money. Um, and, and the reality is, is they probably are less concerned about the poor than they are about the fact that this money that could have been used for them to, in their ministry i.e. bought them new sandals, bought them some food, covered their expenses, all of that stuff. It's just being poured out onto Jesus. And, uh, and then Jesus basically, you can tell how tired he is. He just, uh, you know, they're scolding her, but he then rebukes them. Let her alone, he says. Do you, why do you trouble her? She has performed a good service for me, for you always uh, have the poor with you uh, and you can show kindness to them whenever you wish, but you will not always have me. She has done what she, uh, she has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for its burial. Truly, I tell you, whenever the good news is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in remembrance of her. Now, this shows up in the Matthew account. It's expanded. Uh, as Matthew does with most of what he, uh, they take from Mark. But the point being is, is there's two things here. She has done this thing for me while I am alive. She has anointed my body beforehand for its burial. And this is important because the burial, uh, when people then were buried, they, they were treated, uh, their body was rubbed with uh, ointments and um, uh, oils uh, in a way to not embalm them, but at least to uh, aid in the uh, decomposition process, but also to keep, I hate to say it, to keep the smell down. Uh, because they were, they were put in, in, in caves, not, uh, buried, they were not buried in the ground per se. And, uh, and so this was a situation where people were going to, and then they were wrapped. And this is very common in the desert in the arid uh, climates uh, and certainly of that era. Think of the mummies in Egypt, how they were treated and then mummified and wrapped and then put in a sarcophagus and things like that. That's 
very much the same kind of thing that's happening here. But you only do it when the person is dead. And you, you know, that's what the whole uh, frankincense and myrrh uh, thing is with the gifts. Myrrh is one of those spices that is used for burial. An odd gift to give a baby at, at its birth when you should only be using it at uh, someone's death. So we have here a foreshadowing of what's about to come. And Jesus is basically saying, you'll always have the poor. You're not going to have me just leave her alone. Let her do what she's done because it's not hurting you. And she's honoring me. And honor is another word for worship. Uh, revere. She is showing me reverence uh, that she knows who I am, uh, loves me, and uh, is doing this kindness for me. Uh, and then the other thing is, is that it, Jesus basically proclaims that whenever the good news is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in remembrance of her. Not of me, says Jesus, but of her, of her act, her act of reverence and worship and uh, sacrifice. So that's just a really, really powerful scene. And I would love dearly to be able to get into, uh, into uh, Bethany to, to, to get to see some of the, uh, some of these sites. Uh, it, it's one of those places that has still eludes me. I'm making it a little bigger because it seems small to me. So uh, hopefully uh, we can see it all a little better. Anyway, we continue on and then we get to the Passover. So we are now back into Jerusalem, uh, walking over the hill, down the valley, up, and then across from the Temple Mount into the city uh, where Jesus uh, tells the disciples to find an upper room. And so they do what Jesus says, and there's all this talk about how they're going to find this person, and they're going to have a, a, a donkey, and uh, and. And it, would, and it seems odd to us today for us just to walk up to strangers and say, where is the, um, uh, the teachers asked, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Like you don't walk into a town and then walk and knock on the first door and say, I'd like to have dinner in your house. Um, please it's make, it, please, please open your doors. Uh, this is what was, but this is all part of the, Going back to Abraham with the three, uh, three angels, the, the law of hospitality, this was all part of that, that when, when this happens, you respond. And sure enough, the man lets them in, and then they start to have the Passover meal, which we have uh, as the first, we call it the Last Supper. We use it as an example of communion. And he then starts to tell them about how he's going to be uh, betrayed and how one of them there dipping the bread uh, is uh, the first sign of intention, by the way. Um, <laughs> it's dipping the bread into the bowl um, that one of you is going to betray me. And instantly they all start to freak out. And uh, even though they're doing all of this, they, uh, they're still having this, uh, this meal. Um, and we have the institution of the Lord's Supper, which from which we get the words of institution that are used. And uh, this is, uh, in essence, Jesus remaking the, uh, the Passover feast and identifying himself as the lamb that is being sacrificed. And I have to think that the, the, that the disciples are, their heads are spinning. This has been a crazy week for them. And now Jesus is talking about how he literally is going to be sacrificed. There's no way they can not get what he's saying. Um, and, and so we have, again, this very short little vignette. And then, boom, as soon as that's done, they're out the door. They went out to the Mount of Olives. So, so literally, they're going all the way back from, to where they came so that they could get to uh, Gethsemane, uh, or at least out of the city. And again... Uh, it's at this point that he talks about he talks to uh, um, to Peter about how he's going to betray him, and Peter vehemently says, "I will, even though I must die with you, I will not deny you." And all of them said the same, uh, says says Mark. 
And, and so if I was hearing this story for the first time, the tension is so is just ratcheting up and you're trying to figure out one of them is going to betray them, but you kind of know it's Judas. So, okay, well, will they figure this out? But now what's going on with Peter? Peter was supposed to be the main character. Peter is supposed to be the apostle that went to, to Rome and most of the people there would have known. Well, what, what is this? What's happening here? And we get to Gethsemane. And uh, if you saw the video that I did for, uh, for uh, Holy Week, this in particular for, well, for both Palm Sunday and for Monday, Thursday, we have the whole Gethsemane area, the tree, olive trees. And it's here that Jesus tells them to wait, be alert, and that he then goes off to pray. And whether it was the wine at dinner, whether it was just the, everything that's gone on, probably all the walking, they fall asleep. He prays and he is stressed. It talks about how he's distressed and agitated and he's praying uh, to God. Uh, I am deeply grieved even to death. Uh, so he says this to the disciples. He goes away and he's crying out to God, Abba, Father, uh, you know, for, for you, all things are possible. Remove this cup from me. Yet not what I want, what, but what you want. And we have this again, this repeated exercise of him going, finding them asleep, him calling out Peter, and then he goes away, and then he comes back, finds them asleep, and, uh, and things are just going back, and he says, get up, let it, uh, he says, time has come to, for me to be handed over to the, into the hands of sinners, get up, let's be going, see my betrayer is at hand, and there's Mark's favorite word, immediately, while he was speaking, Judas one of the 12 arrived with uh, the crowd with the swords and clubs and he's arrested. There is this very odd little thing here with the arrest, talking about a young man who was following him wearing nothing but a linen cloth. They caught him, but they left the cloth, uh, linen cloth and ran off and he ran off naked. Why? I, people have wrestled with that particular passage <laughs> for, for 2000 years. But uh, point being is, is he's arrested. He's then taken to the council. There's the long trial scene. He's then, uh, but in that trial scene, we have Peter's denial. He's outside. And for them to, to arrest him, they took him from the garden back across the valley, across the city, and then towards um, uh, southeast, sorry, southwest of, of the temple to where Caiaphas, the high priest was. And so again, a lot of walking and they're trying to get him to, to uh, incriminate himself. And, and he basically is saying, you know, there's no point in hiding it. So he says he is who he is. And, and they then cry out that, uh, you know, uh, you know, he's blasphemed. Meanwhile, Peter, who had been slinking along behind them, afraid of being uh, arrested himself, is in the courtyard. And in order to stay warm, the people who are in the courtyard, the household staff, the soldiers, whoever, uh, they have a little fire going. And while he's, he sort of gets up and goes beside the fire, uh, one of them says that, uh, you know, um, one of the servant girls says, uh, are you, you also were with Jesus uh, and uh, the, the man from Nazareth. And he denies it. I do not know or understand what you're talking about. And then he goes to another part of the, the courtyard. Uh, and, and so uh, then the cock crowed. And the servant girl on seeing him began again to say to the bystanders, no, this man is one of them. And then again, he denies it. And uh, then after a little while, he goes... Uh, the bystanders go to Peter and say, certainly you are one of them for your Galilean. Uh, and, and in another uh, gospel, they talk about how his, his language, his accent, and, 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 uh, and then he begins to curse and he swore an oath. I do not know this man that you were talking about. And it's then that the cock crowed for the second time. And Peter remembered uh, that Jesus had said that before the cock crows twice, uh, you will deny me three times and he breaks down and cries and all of a sudden we're just the tension is just it's like what's happening jesus goes before pilate 
and in, in order to go to Pilate, they had to go to another part of town. So again, Jesus is being walked across town because they're not going to put him in a paddy wagon. <clears throat> and while he's there, uh, and this is now in the morning, they're trying to figure out how to deal with Jesus um, because they're not going to wake Pilate up for this. Uh, the people cry for Barabbas, who was in essence a political terrorist, uh, but he was, you know, at least he wasn't claiming to be the son of God. Uh, and, and also they were agitated by the, the priests. They were stirred up by the priests. So they cry out for Barabbas, crucify Jesus. And Pilate, who seems to not want to do this, uh, what, is, what evil has he done? And he keeps asking for proof. And yet they keep saying, crucify him. And so he, in another text, washes his hands and says, take him away. The soldiers beat him up. They mock Jesus. Uh, they, put, they put the crown of thorns on his head and they wrap him in, a, they strip him and then uh, they, uh, put his, um, they put this purple cloak on him to try and make him look like a clown, uh, mocking him that he was the king. They then strip him again, put his clothes on him and then they march him away. One of the things for me that I've always found interesting is, is these side pieces. And Mark at this point brings in Simon of, of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus. And we sort of think, okay, here we are in chapter 15, right in the middle of the crucif you know, the, the penultimate death scene. And we're being introduced to Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus. And um, we talked a bit about this when we did the Barnabas series. Simon of Cyrene and, uh, and Alexander and Rufus were patrons of the first church in, uh, the, after the crucifixion. Um, and they became very involved in the first church. But what's interesting is, is they're not, uh, they are not Jewish uh, citizens. They are not Jews from Jerusalem. These are people from away. These are people who are not, uh, you would not think A would be there and B would become players in this Jewish sect because Jesus was Jewish. And Jesus himself said, I did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill them. And the church, uh, was, there was no attempt to create a new religion. There was an attempt to rehabilitate Judaism. And yet here we have this person and we're identifying these people. And the, the reason Mark is doing this is because he wants the people who are hearing this story, who are not Jewish, who don't live in Jerusalem, who are not sure where they fit. He wants them to know that someone like them, Siren, Simon of Cyrene and Alexander and Rufus were part of what's happening here. And so, right, we just get this random thing, and then they do the whole thing about the crucifixion. And we have the dialogue with the, and I'm not trying to run over, but I, there's a lot to go through. Uh, you know, we have the conversation with, with the, with the uh, criminals. And, uh, and we, we get to the point where uh, everyone is taunting them. And, and what's, uh, we get to the death of Jesus, and now it's noon, and all of a sudden, darkness comes over the land until three in the afternoon. Uh, people talk that this might have been an eclipse, uh, obviously something that was natural, or in a way supernatural, it was not usual. And at three o'clock, Jesus, after all of the things that have happened to him, has, you know, uh, being stabbed, being, you know, the various things he's not, and being beaten, he is not, uh, he, he's dying. He cries out at three o'clock with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, Lema, uh, Sabachthani, uh, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I added into this, uh, on this document, Psalm 22 from the NRSV, um, but uh, Felicity, do you have that Jim Taylor version handy? 
Yeah. You just read the first couple of verses from Jim Taylor's version of Psalm 22. From the start? Yeah, right the, from the start. First, just the, the first, first couple of verses. Alone. I'm all alone. There is no God. There are no friends. I'm all alone. I call all day, but no one calls me back. I cry all night, but no one comforts me. Could God create a world this rotten? Could any God call this good? Our ancestors were deluded. They trusted God. They thought God changed the course of history for them. They actually believed it. With scientific detachment, I know that I am nothing. Nothing I do makes any difference. Universes and social systems roll inexorably onward. They mock my pathetic struggles. They laugh at my lofty ideals. Let's stop there. That's a good yeah. place to stop. Uh, that's a modern take on the 22nd Psalm. Uh, it's not far from the, the gist of what uh, the psalmists wrote. But what's interesting is Jesus is quoting this Psalm as he's dying. And by doing this, he draws attention to the psalm. And if you read through the NRSV version that we have, I have attached to it, you will find that there are actually, not only does he quote it, but it is as if this psalm is being, was a prediction of what was going to happen. Because it talks about how uh, he would be stripped, how the, the guards would, um, would, uh, draw lots for his clothes um, and, and, how, uh, and, and how he would die. And, and so it is almost as if all of this is playing out. Now, Jesus obviously knew scripture. He quoted scripture all the way through his life and ministry as according to the, script, uh, the gospels. So maybe he was seeing what was happening and, and this reminded him of Psalm 22, but I would think it has more to do with the fact that this was one last moment and one last opportunity for Jesus to remind people of who he was. And in this case, he was the suffering servant, which comes from Isaiah uh, 53. And Isaiah 53 talks about how the suffering servant would come to be God's messenger, but would be beaten and abused, uh, uh, discounted as nothing of any worth uh, and how he would uh, would die and but would die for the saving of the sins of the people of Israel and so we're we're left with this scene of Jesus quoting this psalm which most people would have known or should have known but the one person who wouldn't have known is the only person we're here, um, you know, the people are saying back and forth, what, uh, uh, you know, they're wondering why he's calling to Elijah uh, instead of God. Uh, and they want to see if Elijah will come and take him away. But then nothing happens. Jesus dies, breathes his, breathes his last, and the temple curtain is torn. Very dramatic uh, image right there. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, not the others, not as even his disciples or the other people, he said, truly this man was God's son. Mm -hmm. Now this was a Roman centurion. This was, this was a foreigner. This was a Gentile. Um, this was someone who didn't know what he was talking about. Didn't probably didn't even know who he was or, even if he did, didn't think much of him. But now he's saying, truly, this was God's son. We have a, we go, it moves quickly from here. Uh, the women were looking from a distance, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, the, the younger and, uh, and of Jones uh, uh, and of Salome. Uh, and we have this idea that they were in the background and they are grieving and mourning. And uh, there are many other women who had come uh, with Jesus uh, to Jerusalem. So we have this scene of, of the disciples in mourning. And from there, 
uh, we have the burial of Jesus and it's the women who now join in with another person, Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea, another outsider who now is uh, a patron who is assisting and we're, we're being introduced to this cast of new characters right at the end. And he gets permission to take the body away and uh, they, uh, the body is then taken, uh, put in this uh, tomb and uh, there's a centurion that is uh, being put there to see what, you know, to make sure he's being buried. And then Joseph uh, brought the linen cloth, taking down the body, they wrapped uh, the cloth and they laid it in the tomb and they took him to the rock and they rolled the stone against the door. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of, it should be Jesus. I don't know why it says Jones. That's the weird, something happened in the translation there. The mother of Jesus saw where the body was laid. Boom. And you just got to feel that for everyone, they thought it was over. It was over. You just, you just feel like the, the lights go out. That's it. It's heavy. It's somber. Uh, and, and they're discouraged. And we, we have this sense that the, uh, you know, the men seem to have disappeared. It's not Peter and it's not any of the other, you know, Andrew or James or you know, John. It wasn't any of these people. Uh, it was this Joseph of Arimathea and it was the women and they took care of him and laid him in the tomb. The stone was rolled in front of it and it was done. And this is such an abrupt stop. Everything in this gospel has just been moving at this pace. And that last paragraph and just those last two sentences you know, they see, like, they've got his body, they wrapped him in the linen, uh, laid it in the tomb, they rolled, then the stone is rolled against the door, and Mary and Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Jesus, saw where the body was laid. And we just, if the Gospel of Mark is trying to get us to respond, What's your response? That actually is a question. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I sense the silence, not because half of you are muted, but I sense the silence is exactly what they wanted us, the author of Mark wanted us to feel, which is there was just, this was, this was like, one of the things I learned, the very few things I learned in science in high school, um, I was not a science person, but it made you take science up to a certain grade. We, we, we got to burn magnesium. Magnesium is this metal uh, compound that burns really brightly but really quickly. And magnesium is used for fuses and a couple of other, you know, other things that you want to continue to burn, but you want it to travel and you want to do stuff with it. And I remember just having this blind spot, this like bright white light in my eye because I didn't stupidly wear the, uh, the goggles that we were supposed to wear. Um, but um, magnesium burns brightly and burns hot and burns quickly. And in a way, what we have here is this rocket flare of, of, a, of a description of Jesus's ministry. We've talked about it. Mark didn't waste any time talking about the thir first 30 years of Jesus's life. And then he packs three years into 15 chapters. Boom, boom, just, it, it starts with a, you know, we're already in mid-flight. We've already lifted off. We're just moving along. And there's this trajectory to it that we are thinking, 
where is this going? How is it going to change my life? What, this is amazing. Why didn't I hear about this before? And then things start to become problematic and we start to get, you know, frustrated. Why is this happening? Who, why would they do this? You know, is, don't they know what he is or who he is or what he came to do and why weren't they listening? And then he's arrested and now we have this. And then all of a sudden he's dead. And this is not a long, like put this up against the gospel of John. One of the challenges that I've had when we've been doing these Lenten Holy Week readers is finding time for Mark <laughs> because Mark's account is so short that it gets lost because of the other three. And it's, it's like, we're, we're just left in silence. So I'm, uh, we have a couple of questions. Uh, I did vet the questions with Gene, which is not to throw Gene under the bus. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I knew that this week was going to be difficult. And I know that it has been a challenging, uh, some of the questions have been challenging. Mm -hmm. um, I wanna break up the group into two Well, groups. are we not having the video? Oh my God. Yeah. Oh my God. Yes. We have to have the video. It's an mm -hmm. amazing video. My apologies. I'm, there was just so much in here. You I were just, hot to trot. Then. Oh, I know you should have, you should have <laughs> waved your hand. <laughs> my apologies, everybody. Uh, I'm just refreshing the video because it just, uh, it, I need to do that when it, and session 10 and all right. Thank you, Felicity. Well, I've seen the video, but I'd like you well, know. I know, I, I, I know you've seen it, but let's, let's, let every, let's get, get everyone else to see it. Oh, hang on. Mm -hmm. Hang on a second. Stop share. I forgot to click something. Just, just so everybody else knows that there are, there are people in my life that I've given permission to tell me to shut up. And Gene and Felicity <laughs> are two of them. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, so. I, I, I honor the fact that uh, they caught me on this. So here we go. I'm going to stop talking. Uh, let's hear what Francis says, and just just soak it, just soak in what uh, what you see and hear. All right. <coughs> I'm in Jerusalem now, and this is one of the most visited sites because it's a place where we traditionally remember the Last Supper. And you have to just try to understand how much emotion is going on in this time. Jesus and his disciples. Remember, Jesus is fully human. So don't read these passages like, oh, it didn't hurt him as much because he's God. Yes, that's true, but he's also 100% man. And so when he gathers with his disciples this last time to have this Last Supper, the scriptures say that he was looking forward to it. Why? Because he really loved these men. And so when he's taking of this supper, it's a very, very intimate time. As I read these verses, imagine, just try to imagine him saying this to these friends of his, that he deeply loves. And as they were eating, he took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to them and said, take, this is my body. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank of it and he said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, 
which is poured out for many. Truly I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. He's looking at this group that he is so close to and so in love with and said, this is my body, it's broken for you. This represents my blood that is spilt for you. And this is it, guys. I'm not gonna drink of the fruit of the vine again until this is all over and I'm back with my father. I'm standing in the Garden of Gethsemane, and this is the place where Jesus comes before his Father and prays to him, and we get to listen in. It says in verse 32, and they went to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. And going a little farther, he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but you will. And he came and he found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again, he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And again, he came and found them sleeping for their eyes were very heavy and they did not know what to answer him. And he came the third time and said to them, are you still sleeping? and taking your rest. It is enough, the hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Here we see Jesus like we've never seen him before, where he says his soul is sorrowful, even to the point of death. It talks about him being distressed I mean, we're so used to him being so confident, and here he is about to approach the cross, about to face the wrath of God for us, and he asks his dad, saying, Dad, you can do anything. Take this cup from me. He just asks him, I know you can do anything, so just take this away. And yet he says, but not my will, but yours be done. And he says this three times. As a dad, I cannot imagine my son begging me. And, and the other gospel saying that he's, he's to the point of sweating drops of blood. Here he is distressed, sorrowful, sweating drops of blood and looking up at his father. I mean, what father can watch that from his son? Saying, dad, you can do all things. Take it away, take it away, take it away. And the Bible says, because the Father loved you and he loved me, he sends his son to the cross. Look, no matter what happens in your life, you should always be able to look to the garden, look to the cross, and know that God loves you. And there's no way I can say that strong enough. Man, we should never be people who question the love of God. An almighty, holy God would go through that and love us so much that he would send his son to the cross.
I am walking up the Via Dolorosa right now. This is the road that Jesus walked up as they took him to be crucified. So a few days ago, they're cheering, they're screaming, they're celebrating him. And on this day, they're spitting on him, mocking him as he goes up to be crucified. It says they clothed him in a purple cloak and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on him. And they began to salute him, hail King of the Jews. And they were striking his head with a reed and spitting on him and kneeling down in homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him. And they led him out to crucify him. And they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide what each should take. And it was the third hour when they crucified him. And the inscription of the charge against him read, the King of the Jews, and with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes mocked him to one another saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also reviled him. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? <clears throat> and some of the bystanders hearing it said, Behold, he's calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let's see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the son of God. So everything we've talked about culminates in this. You have Jesus who took the form of a man came down on this earth. He chooses these disciples. Crowds are following him. He's performing miracles, showing his power. He's, he's healing the lame. He's casting out demons. He's walking on water. He's, he's creating bread and fish from nowhere. He's raising people from the dead. People are screaming Hosanna one day and then crucify him the next. And then he's in the garden having this conversation with the father. Oh, God, Dad, is there any other way? And ultimately, it ends here at the cross, okay? At the cross. There, this is the site of the greatest act of love in all of human history. How does anyone explain, like, God himself loving us so much that he would die, that he would suffer on a cross right here for us so that I can be totally cleansed, totally clean, and I can actually come into the presence of God? That's what the cross is about. It was to bring us to the Father. And 
Mark starts this book talking about the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And if that good news of the Son of God dying on a cross for your sins doesn't make everything else in your life just look so foolish and worthless and like nothing compared to the cross, then you don't get it. Man, you don't get it. And I just so worry that some of you don't get it. This is so much bigger than every other thing in your life. And so if you don't get this, man, you need to go back, read this book again and again and again until everything in your life looks so menial, means nothing to you. And your life itself means nothing to you compared to the good news of Jesus Christ. God, please, by your Holy Spirit, will you open our eyes to the greatness of your good news. May we gladly follow the example of our Savior Jesus and die to this world. We love you, Father. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs>
Let me just find them. Give me one second. Uh, the questions are, uh, come on. Let's read the questions. We are running out of time. I, I, I'm getting to them. Uh, mm -hmm. The questions are, uh, I'm putting Send them- Send us to the breakout room. That's what I'm saying. And we'll read them there. Oh, okay. I'll do that. All right. I've automatically, uh, I've let the machine do it, so uh, you're with who you're with. So here we go. Uh, there will be two groups of four. Let's come back in uh, 15 minutes, okay? So pick and choose your questions. You guys caught me eating my cookie. Mm. <laughs> well, I, I gave you a little bit more time because I had to go deal with the puppy, but I know that these have been difficult questions. Um, I also know that we had to have a new, a new scribe in group one, so... <laughs> Welcome to the Scribe Club, Felicity. Not me. No, no you weren't the scribe. Who was the scribe? Maureen. She's Maureen. Muted. Oh. Maureen is muted and Matty is muted and Eunice is muted. All right. Uh, so Maureen, if you're, are you with us, Maureen? We'll need you to unmute. Okay, good. <laughs> All right. Uh, the questions, uh, and, and one of the things I was going to say off the top um, is uh, these are very difficult questions. So maybe uh, if uh, you didn't get to all of them, these are things that you can look at over the course of, uh, of the week. Um, but the first question was, uh, many believe that the woman's anointing was a selfless act. Actually, you know what? We don't have a lot of time, so maybe why don't you? What does in group one talk about the question that really got the most energy and um, and in terms of conversation uh, and the one that I think you guys wrestled with the most? I, 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 I trust that you got through all of them, but let's hear let's hear the one that was was seemed to be important for group one. Maureen, can you do that for us? Uh, can you hear me, Jim? Yes, we can. We can see you, we okay. can see you though. Oh, okay. Well, at least you can hear me. So yeah, that's the one. Uh, I think it was the final question that was really the pivotal one for us because it was the whole focus on the pain and suffering. Uh, and it made us really realize he was a human being. And not only that, he knew what was coming. And as a result, he had to trust God and in trusting God, as one of the participants said, we come to realize that the impossible can be possible. And it also showed us the place of his deep obedience, despite what was happening. And then there's a reflection on the capacity of God, the father himself. How could any father watch his own son and consent to his own son's suffering. So I think, uh, or we came to the conclusion that he really deeply loves us to be able to allow his own son to undergo such suffering for us. And they're, they're one of the persons recognized there's a movie, Passion of Christ, um, she rewatched it. It is so intense, and it really makes you realize that here was a person who was human, who knew what was coming, and yet was obedient to that whole process. So it really does what Francis Chan was talking about, is bring us to that realization that our way is a way of suffering and we are on the pathway with Christ 
and we have to submit our lives to him. Wow. Uh, thank you. That, you guys did. You really did wrestle with it. Uh, I'm trying to remember the name. There was a recent movie that came out, uh, which was from the centurion's point of view and the character of the centurion. Uh, and the journey that had he had to go through yeah. as being Roman and and whatnot to come to this, uh, it, it it's not in my mind right now. But it came out uh, since I've been here in in Brampton a few uh, years ago. Yeah, I saw yeah. that. Yeah, uh, it, it it was very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, the the Passion of Christ is just a powerful, powerful movie. Um, but thank you. Uh, group uh, two, uh, I'm not going to assume who the scribe was, but why don't you do the same? Why don't you pick the one uh, question that you uh, and your group uh, sort of wrestled with and had the most uh, uh, conversation around, and we'll focus on that one. Um, we'll do question one. All right. Um, can you put it up on the screen? I'm, I'm about to do that. Yeah. Uh, no. Okay. Yeah. Um, for the first part, we did we believed that the woman's act was of selfish, selfless, sacrificial worship. And we question asked the question, how who was this woman? And we only know was she one of Jesus's followers? Did she just was she a servant? And um, how did she know what drove her then to do this act and anoint Jesus with this very expensive oil? And that she didn't take into account um, the cost of it. She was willing to give up all the oil and regardless and uh, um we, we thought that her action was a gift and um then we started trying to think of what place does sacrificial devotion get given gifts to god have in worship and we questioned and went back and forth with that and had questions again about what would we call giving gifts to god in worship and uh, we came up with the simple answers of our offering when we to participate in the service by um, reading the lessons or taking up the offering or being ushers at the door greeting people. We had, yeah, we, we, we kept spent some time on this going back and forth about sacrificial gift and the woman. Who was she? How did God speak to her and send her to anoint Jesus at that mm. moment before his death? I, one of the ways I've, I've read in, uh, in a paraphrase of the Gospels uh, talks about how Jesus says she did a beautiful thing for me uh, and that it, there would be the sense that she would have and the way I imagine it, it well, first, I imagine that she was a member of the household, uh, that she was, this was her home. Um, this is why she knew where the jar of alabaster, she wouldn't walk around with this alabaster jar of, of nard. Um, this was something that had been treasured, kept, uh, and she was moved uh, to want to do a beautiful thing for Jesus. And I can imagine her just saying to herself, what can I do? What, how can I give something beautiful to him? And, and I'm, the reason why I keep saying the word beautiful is, is I, I have this sense that this was not a conscious act. This was an, in, and not so much impulsive in a random kind of way, but that this was, this was just a, an a, a yearning to respond gracefully to the grace that she had received. And there have been times in my life, and it's usually focused around 
my love for my children, uh, for Regan, uh, for my mother, uh, the, that, that you just want to do something beautiful <laughs> for someone. Mm -hmm. and, and, what, and that's what she did. So I don't know who she is. As I say, there are specul there's speculation that she was part of this family. Uh, she could well have been Martha or Mary, uh, could have been someone else. But um, if it is Lazarus, Simon, Martha, Mary, that could have been the context. Having said that, it could have been, I, I suspect she lived in the household, but she could be any of us. And the response is, is how can I give this? The second thing about this act for me that is so powerful is how intimate it is. Um, if you read through the Song of Solomon, um, you, which is this long extended love poem, um, uh, you have this uh, imagery of, of, the, of this very intimate exchange, but also how one prepares oneself, but how one also anoints the other. Uh, there, there is a very physical, tactile, emotional aspect to this act. Uh, it's not like she just <laughs> took a picture and dumped it on Jesus's head. This isn't Lucille Ball dumping, mm -hmm. you know, the, 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 the table water over someone's head. This is, this is it going down. And then it is a question of, of, of touch. There's touch here. There's mm -hmm. smell. There is, uh, and then with the wiping of his uh, feet, you know, there, there is, there's contact here. Uh, and in that regard, there's that sense of beauty. Uh, and, and please, I'm not trying to get it into a, an un uncomfortable space, but just that idea of, of you are so, you just want to give. Um, and it, it's such a powerful image. And it, so the group, you guys quite, you're right. What were the, you mentioned servant girl or, uh, someone from Jesus's group. Was there any other ideas as to who she was? Well, I thought that in one of the Gospels that she was near, but we checked Matthew and it wasn't in Matthew. So the only other one to check, look at now is Luke. But we, um, I wasn't sure about that. Maybe I read that somewhere else that some people thought one of the Marys. Right. Uh, yeah, there, there are a lot of Marys. I uh, couldn't, th <laughs> everywhere you turned, there was a Mary. Um, but the idea is, and one of the reasons why I like the fact that she doesn't have a name is she could be any of uh, anyone. Um, and it doesn't, but at the same time, uh, the idea of, of I, I like the term offering, because in this context, offering really does sound like a sacrificial gift. We talk about offerings and it's, it comes and goes. We don't really think about it uh, as much, but here we have something that really is uh, a sacrifice, a gift, um, it's very powerful. Well, thank you for that. I don't want to go too much longer. Um, I, I did go over, there's so much in this. Uh, I, the one thing I did wanted to say just as we wrap up is, is Francis also talks about it. I talk about it in the commentary that I posted is that there throughout the gospel, but also throughout the you know, whole Bible, especially in the New Testament, there is this sense that the Bible is a record of God's plan, his saving plan for, for his creation. And, and I have to believe this. Um, I love, I love the fact that there's this balance and there's these, it, it, it's interreferential and it ties and it weaves itself together. It is a cohesive story in the, in the sense that it has its own logic, its truth, its reality. But, but the Old Testament prophets and God himself and how it's written, even in like the third chapter of Genesis, Genesis 3.15, we have the prediction that a child will come mm -hmm. to defeat satan and to redeem the world genesis 3 okay then those pro those promises become more uh, elaborate we're even told in isaiah 
that his name will be Emmanuel because he will be God with us. Uh, we hear a lot of those predictions, or uh, I make a point of have, us having those predictions uh, in uh, our Christmas Eve service because we want to make sure we root what's happening, just as the, um, the New Testament authors did. They were trying to root uh, and prove that Jesus, his birth, his life, his ministry, his teachings, his death, all were fulfilling the, what was being told in the Bible, in the Old Testament. First for the Jews, because they were trying to convince them that Jesus was in fact the Messiah. And then uh, after that, for the world to say, here is this good news. This is the gospel. And if you read the Bible or see the whole Bible in, it, in this context, you really get this sense that everything just moves to this moment. And as, as, as Francis said, you know, he kind of talked about just within the gospel of Mark. The gospel of Mark is just a juggernaut to get us to this point for us to be challenged by his death. And it kind of leaves us hanging. Where's the good news? And the answer is next week. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we'll, we'll meet next week. But before we do that, and we're going to have communion, but let's, uh, let's uh, have some, uh, let's pray. Uh, I know that Kim is not well, but uh, uh, not feeling 100%. Uh, we'll pray for Sandra and, and uh, her uh, the things that she has to deal with, also her sister. Are there other uh, people or things that we need to pray for? All right. I trust that in silent prayer, God knows the, the language of our hearts. So we'll have, a, we'll have a brief moment of silence in the prayers for, so that we can all pray for the things that are on our hearts. But let's pray. Gracious God, as we gather before you, we gather in silence, we gather in humility, we gather in the, the stillness of, of feeling the sudden weight of what has happened and what we have read in these two chapters of this gospel. The gospel is indeed good news, and, and yet uh, we are struggling and wrestling with the challenge of of the death of your son Jesus, of how uh, of how this could indeed be part of your plan, how uh, how you could indeed uh, send your son to be uh, to be sacrificed on our behalf, that you would love us so much that you would do this. We are humbled, we are awed, and we feel challenged, but yet we know you are a God of grace and a God of compassion. And that this is part of your plan. And we just pray, be with us in this, in this moment as we feel suspended. Suspended between what we have heard and what has happened and what we hope will come. And we pray also for those who are, were not able to be with us, for, for Kim and how she is not feeling well. And for Sandra with the issues that she has to deal with and, and the others who will be joining us uh, later online. We just pray for all of them. We pray for those known to us who have been dealing with uh, COVID and their concerns around their health. We pray for Donelda and for uh, Glenn uh, Brunskill's family uh, who has recently suffered uh, losses due to death. May they indeed be reminded that you are an Easter God and that we are an Easter people. And that as we look into that uh, valley and as they deal with that valley, we pray that you would let them know that your presence is always with them. And gracious God, as we take a moment in silence, hear our prayers as we offer them to you in and through your son. Holy God, we give thanks, even in this quiet stillness of what has been a Good Friday, uh, the death of your son on a cross, 
his body being laid in a tomb. We give you thanks because we are indeed an Easter people and we look forward to the glory of the good news of the resurrection. And I pray that you be with each and every one of the people in this group, keep them safe, keep them well, and may they always be aware of your presence. And we pray this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. All right, folks, thank you very much. Uh, Jean will send out a reminder next week uh, or as the week goes on <coughs> so that we can meet again. And I pray that you indeed all stay well and safe. Thank you, every uh, Jean, you have your hand up? Or are you pointing? Yes, you, can the two of us stay on, on Zoom for a couple minutes? Who? Me? You and I, yes. You and I, yes. Okay, <laughs> we'll do that. Okay. Bye, Bye, guys. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. You're Bye. welcome. Thank Bye. You. Thanks. <laughs>